Buona, buonasera a tutti, grazie di essere venuti, quelli che siete di fuori. Sono molto felice di avere stasera con noi eh, Enrico Malatesta e Attila Faravelli che sono, hanno passato questi ultimi tre giorni con i residenti di fabbrica, con gli artisti in residenza a fabbrica. E sono anche molto felice che, che riusciamo a fare questa lecture aperta a tutti, anche online. Eh, un po' per introdurre la, la questione, abbiamo partito questo, questa prima diciamo, settimana di questo nuovo semestre eh, dove abbiamo partito con una lecture la settimana scorsa di Tim Ingold e continuiamo eh, oggi con questa lecture aperta e questo workshop che loro hanno dato qui a Fabrica e che vedrete anche su alcuni degli aspetti nella lecture che vi proporranno. Evidentemente la lecture sarà in inglese eh, però tutto il dialogo dopo possiamo anche farlo in, in italiano, visto che loro sono italiani, però come abbiamo un gruppo internazionale a fabbrica vi chiedo questa scusa già di partenza. No? Eh, per il resto volevo introdurre un, un minimo a Enrico e Attila e dopo passare un po' eh, la parola a loro. Eh, volevo anche invitarvi dopo, a, a parte di fare delle domande, anche a vedere una piccola esposizione di alcuni dei lavori eh, di, di Attila Faravelli, il label che ha Aural Tools e in, in certi aspetti magari possiamo anche discutere dopo la lecture più in dettaglio di queste cose. No? Eh, cosa dire, no? non voglio fare una presentazione così alta, Enrico Malatesta musicista, eh, una delle figure importanti soprattutto di, di un nuovo eh, vedere della, del, del, della percussione del, del, di, anche dell'arte sonora in Italia e anche una figura internazionale e Attila Faravelli anche un, un, picco, un mago diciamo, delle nuove eh, tecniche di registrazione soprattutto anche una visione del film ricordi e soprattutto eh, sono felice che ci parlerà anche del suo progetto Aural Tools che credo sia un, un, un progetto molto interessante soprattutto da, da, da presentarvi e il resto eh, dare la, la benvenuta e ringraziare loro per, per essere venuti e grazie mille. Grazie. Hello. Thanks Carlos and Fabrica for the invitation. It's been amazing being here and spending a few days together with this group of uh, young people, artists, that manifested a very deep interest in our practice, at least this is how it seemed to me, that they were interested. And today we had the opportunity to see the results of these three days of um, research. And they did both a series of field recordings and a set of um, short performances and they were all very, very nice and interesting. And this always amazes me how, for example, the same group has been using the very same equipment as another group while producing completely different uh, results. So I'd just like to tell a few words about the title of the workshop that we've been proposing together with Enrico which is the Dance of Attention. I'd like to read you an excerpt from a text by Brian Masumi and Erin Manning. Masumi is an important philosopher and translator of Deleuze in English, for example, whereas uh, Mas Manning is uh, uh, also a philosopher and scholar as well as a dancer. And within this uh, text, the, they analyze the experiences by autistic people who kind of tell the way to perceive reality that for me and Enrico is crucial, which is without discrimination. So I just read you these few words. They say related to the autistic way of perceiving the, the world. To experience the texture of the world without discrimination. Texture is patterned, full of contrast and movement, gradients and transitions. It is complex and differentiated. To attend to everything the same way is not an inattention to life. It is to pay equal attention to the full range of life's texturing complexity with an entranced and 
and hierarchized commitment to the way in which the organic and the inorganic color, sound, smell, and rhythm, perception, and emotion intensely interweave into the aroundness of a textured world alive with the inference. It is to experience the fullness of a dance of attention. And I'd like to tell you a very brief um, story of what happened on the first day here where we were playing some recordings to the participants without telling them what they were. So no way for them to know what I was making them listening to. And uh, one of them, um, after a while, told us that this sounds like the mechanical sounds, so the sounds made by mechanical objects sounded a bit like animals, and that the sound by animals sounded a very mechanical. And that in the end, it's really not possible, not possible to distinguish be between living beings and materials, because there's a, there's a vitality in the materials, and there's, of course, a mechanicity in the living beings. And I think that the approach to field recording and to sound that me and Enrico has, have been exploring together for a few years now has a lot to do with this idea of being able not to differentiate, so to just get out and listen to what's already there, to pay attention to what already is there. And as the participants uh, expressed so well during these days, everything can become object of our, our attention and appreciation. For example, today some participants did a very nice uh, performance by hiding themselves be, be behind a wall in the church. And it was kind of, kind of amazing how their voices sounded like if the wall was speaking to us. Then other people were exploring the small puddles and lakes by throwing small stones into it and again there was this sound of the water and the sound of the stones and the sound of their hands playing with the water and um, I think that in a way what we were trying to express and to tell them uh, somehow reached them and I'm very happy about this. Also one of the bases of uh, this uh, workshop, which is also one of the basis of my own research, which has more to do with field recording, which is a practice of basically taking it, the microphones into, into the world. Uh, what, what really is relevant to me is a concept by uh, the Japanese sound artist Toshia Tsunoda that I'd like to read you which is also in the part of the text that we use to present the workshop. Toshia Tsunada says about field recording, this, the title of the text is about my field recordings. He says, documenting is based on reality, but it is not a secondary supplement to reality. Documenting is not just a hollow version of reality, but is in itself a complete autonomous being that exists within its own space and time. In other words, documenting plays its own role in our world. For instance, and this is quite interesting as a metaphor, I think, and very clear, he says, for instance, although footsteps are just a physical mark on the ground, we acknowledge them as an independent matter, separate from the ground itself. This is because we have the ability to recognize images. This image can be described as a trace left by many factors colliding in a given space. I prefer to describe my recordings as a trace of reality rather than a relation to reality. Or another word that I don't like that is usually referred to when talking about field recording and we tend to think of them as a representation of reality. And as you participants have been experimenting, it's 
quite another thing listening to the world through the microphones and recording the sounds and experiencing sound through these technological devices and to just be there with your own body. So, I think I'd like Enrico to say something. Yeah, good evening. Uh, my name is Enrico, and uh, yeah, I just want to add um, something from what Attila says, that we work together since many years, even if we are, we are totally in a different position in terms of how we relate our own practice to sound, but uh, first of all, we are very good friends. Uh, which is important sometimes to work well with uh, someone. So we tend to resonate a lot one to the other. And uh, I think we both, uh, we are both keeping working together because we are, um, basically because we are learning a lot one from the other. And uh, my work is mostly based on percussion instruments formally in the sense that I face the audience generally using percussion instruments, so musical instruments musical instrument that uh, has a very clear, sometimes, identity in the, in the way we perceive it, we watch it, and uh, also from what we expect from it. Uh, I, I am a classical trained percussion player, so I've studied basically snare drum and timpani when I was, uh, I mean, younger at the conservatory. And, uh, but I always uh, had this strange feeling with uh, certain structure that the music has, uh, parameters, rules, not, not because I don't like rules, but uh, I don't uh, felt um, very overlapped in terms of energy by just accepting some rules. And all of my work is based um, in my intimacy to um, present uh, the musical instrument as an as, as, um, assemblage of different materials, meaning different vitalities, different way to react to impulses, uh, different way to express also some vitalis vitalities in the way the material um, create a relationship or a system of relationship with the acoustic of a space. And uh, so I tried to, de to I developed uh, for many years what is called uh, generally extended techniques, uh, which are really related to like impro music, free jazz, uh, and you know electroacoustic experimental stuff, but uh, later on I focused more on a very simple and basic rudimentary way of acting on the instruments. Uh, so I felt very comfortable with the title of the um, this spring summer season at Fabrica, which is Archaism, and uh, I digged a lot in um, both in ideophones, so like archetypes of musical instruments, but especially in the way the body. Uh, as to create, uh, to negotiate you know, with the material, with the shape of material, with the weight of material, uh, with the way mat a material can vibrate uh, with a very simple stimuli. Ideophones are, I mean, in the, if you buy the, this very common book, which is the History of Musical Instruments by Kurt Sachs, or maybe I no, that's not the author. But I don't remember the name of the author. Sorry. Um, there's uh, one chapter based on these instruments, which are not, uh, you know, put together with uh, in terms of specificity. But uh, what creates the families of these instruments are the way the body have to act in order to produce sound with certain materials. So basically, these instruments are uh, actually common tools. Most of the time, found objects, found materials with very rudimentary assemblage. And uh, their sound is basically um, an extension of a body, mo a body mo movement. So there's no uh, structure that uh, I have to learn to deal with. There's no uh, passages that I have to understand how to articulate my hands or my body to create uh, a language, no? a code out of sounds. Um, so what, what me and Attila, uh, we joined together in, in this uh, opposite side, so technology and uh, deep knowledge on how to record sounds, how to take field recordings, why taking field recordings, and very simple action, simple movements applied to very narrow spaces, like the one of a snare drum, for example. So I try to, to play my instrument, especially skin instruments, as a field. It's a very small, very small scale field of actions. 
Uh, and with Attila, we learn together how to um, record better or in an open way um, a very small activity, but which could be very full of details, full of uh, inner vitalities. How can we make a depiction out of, out of the recording? Meaning, how can I perceive my body? Can I use my experiences, my memory, while I listen back to a recording that Attila took? where my emotion, my sensation are completely pulled out. And I also learned, uh, I mean, from him, but also from a lot of colleagues of mine that work with technology, to give more dignity to very simple, poor, and apparently um, empty sounds, which I think is uh, very important as an artist, but also as a person, first of all. Um, so to try to not to underestimate anything in terms of what they can express through sound and especially how can I use my sense of touching, my way of, of um, moving to create sound and using the sound as an, um, I would say, a zone of connection no? Be between two different uh, vibration, meaning one is one of my, the one of my body and the one that I can transmit from a surface to a surface of an object. Um, so yeah, actually I brought the snare drum to play a piece because I prepared a very short piece for Fabrica that I never played before. So the participant at the workshop already heard that like five or six times, so maybe they are a bit bored about that, but um, is a combination of very simple action with the two hands, uh, using the snare drum as a resonator and this small gong as a main um, like surface of vibration. Um, and it's a very simple technique that um, it allows me to go deep into the, the, the energy of the tool, meaning the snare drum in that case and the other materials, but also enact the acoustic of the space and create clear layers of um, uh, relationship, but also layers that you can detach one from the other by listening. So sorry, what sorry to interrupt you. This is the reason why the participants has, have been listening to the piece many, many times, times yeah. because we, Enrico was interested in playing it in different spaces inside our fabrica and every time sounded quite, quite different. So the idea would be able to be, to appreciate this kind yeah. of relationship with space. So I think I play now and then Attila will take over.
So I will modeling the time of the BP according to what's best and easiest in order to get this system going on with the less amount of energy. So it's important for me to, I tend to work um, a lot of on sustained faster, play a lot, long time. And in order to do that, it's uh, very important to, uh, to try to use the less amount of energy as possible. No? So that's the way I generally work. And that's the way also we present our work in terms of the relation with material to participants of the work. And that are mostly the things we also tend to equal during the work. Very simple action, basic movement of the body, uh, basically based on just touching things, believing that just the act of touching is uh, uh, open up a world of sound possibilities because if I, when I touch, I move, I get and I transmit and I move free. That's uh, generally if on or if to other things or on other things, on other things. So I'm gonna play it like just a few minutes.
finish up by <coughs> just telling you that in case you're interested outside, as Carlos said, you're going to find on a table a series of uh, very simple objects that are meant to be producing sounds that I've been producing and releasing together with other musicians. Two of them, we did, it, we did them together with Enrico. And just to give you a very broad reference about the project, uh, years ago I wanted to do this uh, record label, experimental music label, but I kind of immediately realized that the musicians that I enjoyed wouldn't fit on a recording because either what they were doing, like in Enrico's case, was very much site-specific or because the concepts behind their productions uh, was so interesting that when you put on a CD, you just don't get it. So I came up with the idea of releasing a series of very simple objects that can be taken seriously as well as, as toys. Some of them can literally be played by kids. And uh, allow us, me, when I do the presentations with Enrico or alone to really allow people to listen to themselves while listening to sound. Because you're kind of forced to produce sounds with them. You're not given a support that you know, like a CD or a vinyl that you put on and you press play. So in this case, with a normal record, you're very active, but the action is quite intellectual and emotional. Whereas I was very much interested in a form of action that was explicitly physical and very <clears throat> raw and rough. So if you are curious, they are outside, and I don't know what time it is, but I'll be around the table. I'd just like to finish our talk by playing you a series of brief excerpts from field recordings. And as I saw that most of the participants to the workshops who are into photography are using film, uh, I was connecting very much to them because in the field recording sector where I'm standing and living, there's not that many people using analog tape. I don't know why. Whereas with filmmakers and uh, photographers, I saw a lot of interest in this older media. So I'd like to finish by playing you some field recording that I took uh, on a on an old cassette recorder.
So, I just want to add one little thing, because uh, also during the workshop we tried at least to promote also an approach to sound which is not really based on ideas, but rather on things. And uh, for example, I, what, what I played before, apart from the fact that you liked it or not, which I'm not really interested in, <laughs> and I am also, <laughs> also not really into um, a lot of judgment of my performances, rather to find a balancing with the space and uh, understand the energy in the moment. Um, I can also, what I do generally and what we tried also to, to, to promote is to find a very basic stuff and try to understand how this basic stuff can change according to a new material that you can use it in order to express it or at, at least to approach it. Uh, for example, if I play, that's a cooking pan, the bottom of a cooking pan. And uh, that's another bottom of a cooking pan. And uh, why, while I found this, I, um, I, I, it took me one year to understand what it was, because I, I went to do a project in this uh, very huge place in which they collect the iron, iron trash. So mountains of steel, aluminum, copper, and so on and so on. And I found this, which is, uh, I mean, of course it's a component of something, but not really a fragment of something. And it has this, um, I mean, at least for me, I was struck by, by its visual presence and the way it's uh, erode, eroded, eroded, eroso, and, um, and rotten. And I became then fascinated by that. And I went to this place many, many times in order to understand what it is. And I found one year and a half later this one, which is clearly connected, but uh, on one side it has still uh, Marathon Inox uh, 18 slash 10, etc., etc., made in Italy. And uh, so I understood that that was also uh, the bottom of a cooking pan. And I did a project that uh, then ended with a long uh, lecture and project in a festival in Brussels named Kunsten Festival des Arts on um, like trash, let's say, in order to be more quick. Uh, but trash that um, they are not really trash yet, so I can try. I try to pull out of this flux of tossing things, of trashing things, some pieces, and try to understand through their sound what I can learn from there, from them, and what I can do. I can do with them also in my percussive practices, and then I, I gave a workshop on that. So I just wanted to very briefly, not in a live uh, energy, play the same pattern with that just to um, got a view about the differences that you can create, just changing one material, but keeping the same condition as before. And then, for example, I, I can just work on the touching of 
the metal and the steel. <laughs> That's the way, the way I try to work and also, and, and also the, the way we try to work together. So to simplify and through that get into not the complexity, but the multi-layered possibilities that you have by just using uh, proximity of bodies, proximity of surfaces, transmission, of energy from one body to the other, which could be, could be also the microphone, no? how to deal with the distance with a sound source, acoustic sound source, and the membrane of the microphones, and so on, and so on. Um, so, I have nothing, say more, nothing more to say. I don't know whether there is any questions or... I'd just like to add, as a very final kind of statement, that it was very interesting for me during today's restitutions to hear the recordings and then to get outside and kind of experience how they had realized the recordings. Because, of course, some of the performances were slightly different, but um, I think it was very relevant. For example, in one case, two participants were working on the resonance. Wait, sorry. No, because we, just to yeah. clarify, because we proposed to the participants to take some recordings with different kind of devices uh, around the area of Fabrica. And then at the end, after listening to all the recordings, I mean, excerpts, uh, extracts from them, we asked them to bring us to the place where they took it, more or less, and they performed acoustically what they have recorded. So we had the first experience of facing the recording and then facing the, the situation. To, to we had the chance to see them, to, to stay in open air with them, with other people, and we open up, actually, you know, a very huge horizon out of very simple, intuitive things. And uh, so you can continue. Yeah, I, mean, I was just going to say that this was very interesting for me and unexpected to be surprised, even though I use the microphones, I have been using the microphones for many years, it's always surprising how different the feeling that you have when you listen to a recording is compared to what you feel like when you listen to a real event. And I was just gonna tell this uh, funny element of one of the performances where the participants, two participants were creating beatings and beating against this um, like uh, big tubes with our outside and they asked us to put our ears next to the tubes in order to listen to these sounds and after the performance they, they told us that of course our presence was changing the resonance of the tube because just the skin and meat of our bodies attached to this huge tube was enough to interfere with the resonance. So, I mean, it's impossible here to, to tell you how many interesting things came up for me, but this came to my mind as we were talking about field recording and sound and live actions. So, maybe... Yeah, that would be nice if we just unknot this formal situation and there are some questions and curiosity and so on and so on, you can, we can start. Also in Italian. I don't know if 
there, maybe we can pass a microphone if there is any question. Don't, don't, don't be shy, maybe. Hi. Um, yeah, it was super nice to hear again, like a little recap also of what we've done and what we've spoken about. And what I was still thinking about it, uh, it was about silence in a way, because we talked about sounds and there's always sound, even though when we're not listening to it or we cannot hear it. So, um, yeah, um, does sound, does silence exist at all or it's just like a condition where we're not able to uh, listen to sound? I don't know, I, I, it's a kind of weird question, but maybe. Uh, <laughs> um. You mean, does silence exist? That's the question. Yeah, in a way, okay. yes, yes. Very weirdly you know formulated. What? I, I, yeah. well, while you, are, uh, you were talking, I, that reminded me uh, two lines of a book from uh, Jakob von Wexkul. I don't know if I pronounce it correctly, which is uh, Theoretical Biolo Biology, the title. And he wrote very briefly, t really two lines, uh, if I remember well, that uh, the most deep sense of quietness, similar to silence, to the idea of silence, is when the, our body is not pushed from the information of our surrounding in any direction. So when you have, a, you, you, you know, no sensation of being pushed by something, meaning that your attention is, it not, is not dancing yeah. somewhere else. And uh, that doesn't really mean that, um, doesn't really mean lack of things, no? But actually, fullness of things then you can just uh, extend yourself, actually, which is nothing, uh, uh, you know, nothing mystical or, uh, but a sense of not being pushed by things. Uh, your attention is quiet, it's not moving, and then for him, at least, could be something that express better silence rather than thinking of the idea of emptiness, which I really, I really love this line, so that's yeah. the, but in a way, it means also maybe being in balance with your surroundings, like... Yeah, but also, for example, I'm very reactive to environment, so the work I have to do as a musician as well is to not to be trapped by things that surround me, especially sounds. And um, so, yeah, when I, 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 I'm learning my techniques to get more into this not being pushed by things, no? So moving less. Mm. Uh, but maybe everybody has to find their own in that, that, in that sense. What, what for sure is that, uh, at least for my experiences so far, that listening is also a way of traveling around, no? To being uh, reached, but also to reach things all together in any direction, in every direction. So it's a very tiring activity, actually when you are um, a bit more aware of that, of this openness. And um, so we have to deal maybe with that in order to understand better what quietness could, could be before silence, I think. I don't know if I answered you, but. Yeah, yeah, thank you. That book is very, very inspiring. And there's also an Italian translation, which is a very, like a reduction of that book entitled, um, uh, animal environments, human environments, and uh, which is, I think, full of uh, very good, uh, positive also uh, inputs. Thank you. Sorry, can I add one thing about? Uh, for, sorry, yeah, because yeah. we <laughs> actually that that has, 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 is related to recording because uh, in my area there's this place which is very beautiful called San Matteo which is uh, actually a road that connects uh, Cesena with Forlì. So you get uh, on this uh, crest, like typical Italian landscape, you know, hills, soft hills, green, greenish, beautiful, fresh air, no houses, no workers, anything. So it's uh, for, the si for the sense of 
sea is beautiful, but uh, is a totally absorbed, um, the acoustic is totally absorbed. It's like an anechoic kind of natural environment. So you get in this very beautiful place. Uh, it seems to be very silent. So, ah, so this is a silent place actually, because you don't really hear anything. But after a while, it's very tiring because um, you start to hear something that thinks that is not, uh, like for example, I went there by car once, and I, uh, I mean, I assure you that that's the truth. I was hearing my footsteps in the um, ground reflected by the car. So there's no, no other sounds, no filters, no nothing. And was more tiring that rather than being in a more chaotic place. So it also depends on the body and how the body reacts to multiple information. No? That as like Ingold said in one of his books, you can correct me if I'm wrong, that we get into the experience of listening through all senses, no, all together. And they find their own way to cooperate or rather to detach one to the other and create multiple trajectory or paths that you can follow. For example, I can continue if you like. <laughs> I like to talk actually, so. Um, this iron place, I'm making links, this iron trashing place I was mentioning before. We had a lot of experiences also through recording in that. But one, th one thing I did once is was to do a very kind of um, informal workshop. And I put a Bluetooth loudspeaker, this portable speaker, playing a white noise in a point of the area, which was really stinky, like chemical or oily stuff, but really unaffordable for the nose. And nobody was seeing uh, the sound source and nobody knew where the sound source was. And I asked to, but everybody was listening to the sound. So for everybody it was clear that that sound, white noise was there. And the task for everybody was to where to, to reach the source of that sound and go with the face as close as possible to the speaker. And nobody went to the same, arrived at the same position because of the smell, you know. So some of them were at uh, 15 meters, other at two. And uh, so that's, uh, I think, a good uh, example of this dance of the senses as well. Sorry to talk too much, but... Uh. Um, hi. Uh, again, thanks for the workshop and my questions to Attila. Um, uh, when we're talking about painting, for example, um, you can sort of... Uh, when the camera was invented is when a lot of the efforts in painting uh, started getting focused on more contemporary expressions because there was no longer a need of, like, realistic... Um, recreation of things and throughout the workshop you have emphasized on the idea of um, field recordings um, like an approach to field recordings which isn't the, the, where the point is not to be accurate but the point is to um, have fun with the textures of it which I would say is a more contemporary approach to it so was there an invention of camera moment for you where something switched in your brain where you said that this is what I want to do with my field recordings. Can you repeat the last part of the question? Was there an invention of the camera moment for you where you said with my practice, at le with your practice at least, that you are no longer looking to accurately represent reality and that you want to just use the textures and have what I would call a more contemporary approach to field recordings? I think that the point for, for me at, at least is that it's not that it's not important to uh, get into reality, but to pay attention to it in a way that let it talk. And when you let something talk, it explodes. It's kind of funny how like, I keep working with Rico and like, I would have given a completely different answer to the same question about silence, because what, what made me think of uh, which is also related to answering your, your question, is how they discovered that there's like uh, a lot of galaxies in the universe because they had uh, free time at uh, the Hubble telescope 
in which is this uh, telescope outside the atmosphere. And so they decided to point the telescope at an empty, completely black point as big as a straw in the sky for, I don't know, maybe two weeks. They made a very long exposition of the camera. And this is a very famous image. It's called the deep field image from the, from the Hubble telescope where you had like 50,000 galaxies. So the reason why I don't think it makes any sense to represent reality is not because I want to have fun or I, I think it's important to be contemporary, because, but because I think that there is reality as such because we are immersed in it and we are it. At the same time, as I told you like on the first day when I was talking about these folds of reality, it's impossible to, to be objective about it. So it doesn't make any sense to be trying to represent it in one way. And uh, it might be more interesting to just uh, be, yeah, having fun is also a possible explanation. But um, I'd say maybe to let it explode, you know? I also like how these technologies, the camera and the microphone are hyper advanced and they're super detailed and super precise and like uh, they are an expansion to our sensory apparatuses and they're meant to be uh, fixing sound into a recording and they're meant to be for us to be able to understand sound but in the end as you saw during those three days it's a mess. If you use microphones, it's like otherworldly. It doesn't sound real at all. It's too complex, it's too... But that's why I think it's important to use the microphones as a tool to, and the camera to explode reality instead of to trap it. Thanks. Is there any other question? Uh, if it isn't, I really would recommend maybe, since there seems to be a bit of a shine situation, maybe go to the other room where Attila will show the instruments and maybe that's a good way for you guys to get to talk directly to, to, to them and also get to know the fantastic project Aural Tools. Uh, before that, I want to invite, extend the invitation for next week we're going to have a lecture on the third, on the 29th of Kensuko Koike, a visual artist who will be also having a workshop and we will have an open lecture. And uh, I thank you all for, for coming and I really invite you to go to the next room and go a little bit deeper in, into the knowledge of, of this fantastic project called Aural Tours. Thank you again.
Thank you.